still hearing them crickets. I don't know what we're going to do, folks, really, as a society. What are we going to do? The crickets don't do it. Interrupting this current neuro-coronial neuro cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is Cricket Tude Busting, episode BTWRLM385. And looking at a whole globe, a whole world full of people on the brink of committing fear aside. Or as we say behind the woodshed, a fear to side. Chicken little virus. Really. Anyway, last week I was talking about a, you are the only one that's going to save yourself. And I was, I brought it down to as simple as I bring, I can understand how to tell you. One letter, one sentence. A citation to an authority that was, we can see there was no evidence fulfilled, sent to the official that's causing you any trouble at all relative to these health orders. Each one of you have the ability to do that. This week, I want to acknowledge the importance of even that one little letter, breaking that into the system, having a copy, and then if you get more legalistic, if you get more lawful into it, You'll send that certified uh, return receipt requested, and you'll have the copy of that letter with you wherever you go right now. Your traveling papers will be a letter refuting the presumption of the government's lawful authority. And so this is what you're going to have to move ahead of this. I've been trying to, trying to tell everybody how this is working. You can't – see, I've seen lots of people – more celebrity, certainly, than what, what I am on the, anywhere on the Internet, supposedly, I guess. This is where we all are. Anybody that listens there, anybody that does it, doesn't even probably understand except for what they get from MSN. But lots of celebrity figures will say, just say no. I cannot condemn that idea enough here. You can't just say no. And we're going to have evidence of that. I'm going to go through an extensive condition. Uh, what, what's going to, how you can identify the, why it's not, not something you can just say no to. And what to at least get the record started on how to combat all the power of the government to come against you in the worst way they can do that, which is a medical communicable problem. And I'm, I've been since the first of the year explaining this. How could I have really known? But here it is. So Vince, I want to point out, Vince put out a, a response, and I thank Vince, everybody who responds through my Twitters to promote the information, to get it out to people. He responds, in this silent war, you save yourself. That was the title of last week's broadcast. I've told you this is down to each one of you. And then he goes on to say, we now have the best evidence yet that everyone develops long-term coronavirus immunity against infection. Your silence is the victory against you. And his hashtags ponder gander our log, um, our log for all the things we post on that to the RLM radio and uh, behind which it. And so I respond to that. Remember, the report last week was you are gaining immunity, and I was telling you about the T-cell test that they don't want to tell you about or they don't want to do, at least in the United States, to at least show your the baseline susceptibility. And this all becomes very important, as I'm going to talk to you today, relative to pressing against a, an immense authority that the government has. that they It's like a slam dunk for them. And I'm going to kind of show you how you set up the tip so the ball don't go in the basket for them. And you have to do this sort of ahead of time. When you, and we're going to talk about someone who didn't do that. And I'm going to show you how their letters tell you how to do that. And this is out of those of you that are, ho hopefully you're tuning in. I help some of you. I told the Twitter to tune in today. You are like Max Egan. I understand you live there. You keep telling everybody what's going on. You keep telling everybody how this world order is there. I'm going to, you're right. I'm not even challenged. I've never challenged you on that. But it's down in your backyard. And I'm, I hope you're tuning in to there's some tips I hope I can give you today that you can help your listenership know they're not helpless and there's something they can do. And the more mass that starts to do this, we'll start to turn this around. Better than what we're seeing in, in Germany and London just going out on the steps in a big parade and a big demonstration. Each one of those people need to write their letter as well. And what's the letter? The letter is the demand how they found an infectious agent where there is no test. There is no test in the entire world for it. How do you substantiate yourself? I'm going to get to that pretty soon. Well, I respond to Vince's point because as I've been doing some research in a couple of areas, uh, I had to want to hit him to know at least. And Vince has been a great supporter of the broadcast. And he 
uh, does set the word out. So I want him to understand that the letter the people need to write, given there is no test demanding evidence of how officials determine the infectious agent causing COVID-19 disease, i.e. flu-like symptoms beyond presumption, is uh, to be much more important to carry with them with what I've run across this week. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about and not. Now, there's some stuff I'm not going to talk about relative to the presumption that's working against you that you have to refute ahead of time or if it and and or it's more difficult when they lock you up or they talk in they they get you locked into something especially now when you're going to go to Australia here in a moment and I um also again the just say no another I got another twitter out to someone responding to a celebrity on the internet who will speak to you about trends and uh, he says, uh, drug lords want to inject the world, just say no. And I, I responded, if one doesn't know, one can't say no. One demands written evidence of the infectious agent certification or determination required in law in every jurisdiction, knowing there is no test support any lawful mitigation measure. That's how one begins to assert no. Your statement of no means nothing. It never really has anyway, but... You don't have a way to uh, empower that unless you look and do what I've been suggesting. Go to the very statutes that the people are using to uh, chicken little, do the chicken little virus, the sky is falling virus, and put it on you. And, and nobody, the letter that you're asking, if I can say it this way, is asking that the, the, the law said that if when the governor said that the sky was falling, that some health agent walked outside to look up and make sure. And that didn't happen. Now, in the process of this last week, and I'm, you know, I'm always waiting for evidence of what's going on, the real written paperwork. It looks like this is legitimate paperwork, even though most people complain it's not legitimate, and that's another thing you can complain about, but not for its own sake. You complain about something not looking official as creating the question of, over its validity. And then you tie that with a whole, of other, a whole bunch of other things you find the statutes required to show that you looked at this note, one of the points, it's not your, the point you stand on, it's just another point. But what you looked at looked like somebody creating a facsimile of an order. You don't stand on one, you stand on a bunch of these points of, of um, not meeting the, the objective basis I keep telling you to go to in the statute. Which means you all have to know your health code. In particular for where the communicable disease section is, you may not have to know about fingernail fungus but that does, or, or, or anything else, but you need to know about the communicable disease part. You need to read that. You need to look, look for all the limitations and all the expansions that they tend to give themselves. Australia is a very interesting place, though. For those of you listening, like, let's say, to Max Egan or, or um, who does the, the, the Crow House, excuse me. Anyway, I don't know these guys so much, but uh, these guys are telling you what's out there. No one tells you what to do about it. If you thought this wasn't happening, what they tell you, what I've told you, what lots of people tell you about moving this new agenda into the world, you're going to find it right now in the health code. It's fascinating to see they're not even hiding it now about this sustainable development. That's now conditioning your rights when they bring this on. If you can't see the gameplay that's been going on since at least the turn of the last decade, to bring laws in to empower this condition and bring your rights susceptible to the three pillars. It's fascinating. It's written right here in Australia. So those of you that want to see this, it's written right down. They're not even hiding it. In the United States, we have to go. I can show you the evidence of it, but they're not been yet so bold as to put this on the front line. It's in part one in this Australian Act. You have to go look for how we sued it in 2013 is I was looking for the leverage funding, and that's, that's what we sued on. Remember, I told you about that. Leverage funding is a clue that you're working underneath that process and that method. These people come right out and tell you. I'll get to that in a second. But what started this whole thing was an email to me of a video, and then I found the Twitter because I wanted the pictures to read from of a letter. And we'll, we can say purportedly, I'm going to go with it because I haven't found anybody to find that this is actually not happening. And it doesn't matter to me. I'll, I'll take these words and I'll explain to you. They give me a grounds to tell you how to anticipate what happens when you get some kind of an order from the government? 
And here, I, as soon as I saw the letter, even without all the proofs that I, you can see that makes it official, my mind jumped right into when we get a miner who has a BLM letter, a command letter to, to tell you to do something, a directive. So if, if everything I've been telling you over the years of how you respond to agency, and this is agency, they use law thumbing through authority of agency to take you out. That everything I've ever told a miner to fight a, a Bureau of Land Management, not a BLM on the street idiot, but the BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management in the United States, again, or even the Forest Service, against some kind of a agency rule by purported violation, is, is came right to the front on how I'm going to show you how you do this. It's the same method of how you piece apart their authority, what you look for, and how you respond. And the most important thing here is someone got a letter and they didn't respond. They just said no to themselves. And you're going to see what, what that brought them. And I'm suggesting strongly to listen very carefully to what I'm saying. You can apply this across the board to every order given by any agency as long as you understand what is supposed to happen and you have a word in your mouth going back and you have to respond. When you don't, Something like this story happens where a trucker going through somewhere I don't even understand in Australia uh, has to give his vitals to some cop around this COVID and he gets home and then gets a letter uh, that he has to go to a medical exam and make a test underneath COVID. And he doesn't. He just says no. He just, underneath his breath, apparently, he doesn't respond to the letter. And they pick him up, SWAT team and all. Let me get to the Christian, uh, Ice Age Farmer Twitter, you can find it yourself. I've, I'll have all these links, and I'm going to have a ton of links today on how you can go look through this and understand what I'm talking about. For those of you on the past cast, hope you have to listen very carefully. I'll try to explain it clearly on the on the broadcast live here about what you're listening for, what you're looking for, how to go about it. You can go back and look, and you'll be able to take these documents and go through just like I'm going to tell you. It's what I do. It's how I go about looking for things immediately to get the major context of whether I'm looking in the right spot, whether or not what I know is an avoidance of all this is proper, and whether or not it's in there. And if it's not, then we have a different type of challenge. If there's something that's not in there, then you get to challenge it if it's attended, attended to a substantial right, a fundamental right, and it's not in there, or it violates that right, you then have an additional claim of unconstitutionality under the act, and you challenge whether or not that's even lawful. Or you go ahead and move against it. So there's a lot of things here, but let me see if I can keep going now. A thread, Australian trucker SWAT teamed at home is the Twitter from Ice Age Farmer. Returning uh, from Victoria to Perth was stopped, asked to take a COVID-1984 test. Uh, he declined, departed. And I'll get to this about the motor vehicle as well. Received a letter wherein a Karen, interestingly, literally a, a name Karen, which I'm not so a fan of the derogatory statement what the Karen meant. I've got an aunt that's named Karen. She's not like that at all, so I don't, don't really necessarily like that, but people have to call people names, I suppose. Or, but this woman's name is Karen in the letter, so it threatens a $20,000 fine and reasonable force to ensure compliance and, and thankfully to Ice Age Farmer for producing a copy of those letters. And so we're going to go through a bit of that. I'm going to read you the first, well, we can read all of it. I'll read at least the first one for sure. It's a short, a two-pager. I'll read it through, and we'll get the term. We'll get what they're saying, and I'm going to show you how you go back and you answer each and every part of it to do what? To throw, to cause a question on the assertion that they've done. Not because you think it's wrong, but because the statute was written objectively to protect due process, and they are failing, and where they fail. And yes, you're going to have to write and take a note about how that works. Otherwise, this is what happens to you. And at some point, I'm beginning to less and less feel like, well, if you don't want to work out this, I told you before, get a word in your mouth, understand the condition before you get there. I don't know about how I feel anymore about people that are getting wrapped up in all this. So we can now go through a letter today, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why. And then here... Again, breaking into the broadcast this this morning, uh, WA, this is Western Australia now, it's all focused right here. This is where the test is going on, on the brutality of how they're going to really put, force you f folks to, to go underneath the, what they start out as a medical health problem that turns into an emergency. 
This is the same method across the the the, uh, the whole world. How did that happen, folks? But anyway, it did. And so, well, I'll show you in the two letters when we get to them how they switch it on people. You have another body of law to understand. But we'll focus on the first one that starts this because he, this the gentleman. I think they gave him his name Jim. Uh, if I got that wrong, it doesn't matter. Whoever, it's you, folks, in the future. This could happen to you walking down the street as well. Right? They just make the presumption you, you're the one, of, you're the vector. I told you this. You're going to be, talk about a walking around like you're a terrorist. No, you're worse than that. You're a medical terrorist. And so, W, Western Australia man set to be the first Australian fitted with a tracking device for alleged COVID-19 breach. Listen to very carefully. COVID-19 breach. Remember that. This is not for anything else. Remember that it's the breach for COVID-19. Those of you been listening to me, you know what that means already. You already know the point. You already know where we're going to go. The 53-year-old man accused of breaching quarantine directions. Apparently someone else that didn't, either wasn't given the opportunity to respond or didn't respond to the direction in writing back or didn't state orally the proper, they'll call them excuses. I say they're lawful remedies, but that's to set the re reset the record as to where the actual burden is. Most people don't even understand what I've just said, but you're going to have to understand what's going on in order to stop these people. Wherever you are, this is the highlight of what's happening in the focal point is in Australia. It's right in Max Egan's backyard, I suppose, if I understand where he's at. And he understands this already. Now, now it's time for the folks that listen to him to, to start understanding what they can do not just complain about the oppression, start to respond to it. And I would hope to see it in mass, like we're seeing London protesters or Germany pro or wherever, wherever the world is, is starting to protest. You don't just protest. You have to write the question to, to throw off the presumption the government's doing right and making the right decisions. If you're silent on that, the presumption works in favor of the government that does no wrong. However wrong it is acting, it does no wrong. And you'll see this in the letter. So he's the first one. Uh, we'll go through the story. He ended up a little bit just to back it up. He went in the, He went for chest pains. Now, my end question on this is, like, what happened to his chest pains after he walked off when they threatened him with a hotel quarantine? And he walked off, and so they tracked him down, and now they're giving him an ankle monitor. Why'd they give him an ankle monitor instead of turning him, putting him in one spot? They've got to track him down. Why? Because he didn't answer right. He didn't flip the presumption. He didn't have an excuse, a lawful, they, they say a reasonable excuse. There's two types of excuses in this W, uh, the Western Australia Code. You've got to look for those. We'll do that. I'll show you they're there. And this is what you're looking for. You're looking for your out. You're looking for, the, for your silence to be their license. Police allege Paul John Lawrence had been visiting family in Queensland and returned to Western Australia on Friday without first applying for permission to return to the state. At any rate, so here we go. Let's get into it because this is what it's going to happen immediately to people. And you're going to notice something that I, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for me to show, but when we, if you go through this, you'll see they do half, half of the job and half right. And that's how you start taking the, out their authority. Because upon the half wrong and half right, you claim va valuable or fundamental rights have been violated. And they, and they caused you to make decisions that you did that are now also being used against you. Which is another discrimination. And they're not supposed to discriminate. Whether I get to that one, I don't know. You'll find it. You read this. But let's get to the letter really quick. I'll read the first two images that I have through and then we'll go back and I'll show you we'll just do a word search through the documents to show you where the things are that you need to notice and how to qualify whether or not that that letter has any validity at all relative to what it's supposed to do or its function and here it is and then we get our direction from these letters of notice of agencies as well for a minor the BLM comes, and in the left-hand corner, typically, they'll tell you it's a code number, and they te tell you they typically are coming through section, it'll be uh, 3809, we know that it's 43 CFR 3809. That's the limit of their authority, that's what they're imposing, and you know you're coming through a rule. When I see that, I realize if the miner had a, a locatable mineral, that rule doesn't apply to that miner. 
So we start off just by identifying whether or not the rule applies. Now this one is so bad that it presumptively applies. So you now really have to take cognizance. And it says Public Act 2016 WA. So what did I do? For those of you listening and figuring out anywhere, anywhere in the world that you get a notice, an administrative notice, this is what you start to do. You analyze your letter right from top to bottom. If it doesn't look like there's a letterhead, take note. Make a note for that. That's just one of the things that won't kill your letter. In fact, you'll see the code. There's no defect that will kill these things. Why you just can't say no. You just can't. You just say no is not going to work. When I've told you before, you make an objection and have the reason. This is it. This is where you're going to see that works. And why? Public Health Act 2016. What did I do? Type that into the Internet. I went WA, popped up, found the Western Australia legislation. Let's read. Section 184.1c, take mental note, we're going to look at that. Medical examination direction. Oh, so this is what the subject matter is. Medical examination direction. Do you think when I'm reading these words for the first time I even know what I'm reading? Well, no, I didn't. That's why you went to the act, you start reading through it. And we start looking at these words. I get a reference, first of all, what is this medical examin uh, examination direction? What's that section? Go read it. Go look above it and go look below it. Get a sense of what they're talking about. First sentence, and I'm just going to read through this. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on 11 March 2020. On 23 March 2020, the Minister for Health declared a public state of emergency. I guess I'm going to just read. I'm going to want, I want to explain it, but I'm going to read this through, and then we'll go back and explain it. Probably the much better more consistent way to read this. I'm going to start over on the second paragraph. On the 23rd March 2020, the Ministry of Health declared the public health state of emergency with effect from, with effect from 1.30 p.m. to 20 March 2020 in respect of the COVID-19 pursuant to Section 167 of the Public Health Act 2016 Act. The public uh, health state of emergency applies to the state of Western Australia. And this actually just answers the question I was wondering, because I'm not sure how how uh, jurisdictionally Australia is actually laid out, but they just explained to me it's in Western Australia. I suppose there's other compass Australias, which are now the states within the code. Reading on here, I, Karen Lopez, an emergency officer authorized by the chief health officer under Section 174 of the Act to exercise any of the emergency powers while the public health state of emergency declaration in respect of COVID-19 is in force direct. I suppose it's whited out here. I suppose that's the name of who they're for, they're targeting uh, to do the following. I think I say Farm was saying his name's Jim for purposes of discussion. I don't know what it is. I also want to know the, the style of the name. Is that style... And don't flip out when I say this because it's, it's a different angle than mostly that you would take if you hear this that you understand what I'm going to ask you. Is that in all caps or not? And I say that relative to the generic use of all caps, not the way most people think about it, but in how they would apply it as a more as a debtor and an entity to be in debt. And then you move that way. And then you find out there's sections in the code that speak to specific premises. And you look at the list of things in that and you realize that's not a house. So you not don't just go off half cocked. Oh, they spelled it in caps. That's an eviction. You say no, it's tied to something and it's designated for a purpose. Now you're going to track it through as one other line in your mind. You keep another category that you're going to likely speak to. In other words, you say I'm not that person, but you just don't say it because they'll just say yes, you are. And here's we got the name, and here's we got the the reason and the evidence that you gave us. So you have, a, you have to go through the lineage of what the name in the person attaches to within the code. Anyway, I've interjected again already. See how that works? There's so much to really talk about here, but I'm going to keep on going. So the force and effect of against that name, apparently the, the, the gentleman that uh, was stopped, and we go on now and say to do the following. Direction. Medical examination. One, you must undergo a test for COVID-19 comprising of taking of samples in accordance with the coronavirus disease 2020 COVID-19 CDNA national guidelines for public health units 
from time to time as po soon as possible and in any event within 24 hours of making this direction. Two, serology testing must not be used for the test for COVID-19. Direction, excuse me, reason for this direction. Listen very carefully how they lay this out. Reason for direction, this is the title now. Number three, you have been given this direction because I suspect you of having COVID-19 and it is necessary for you to undergo a medical examination to determine whether you do have COVID-19 in the interest of preventing the spread of COVID-19. Moving to this next page, it's another image. You get these links as well later. You can go through this. Penalty and further enforcement of this direction. Is it heading? It is an offense of a person to fail without reasonable excuse to comply with this direction punishable by a fine of up to $20,000 for individuals. Please also note that if you do not comply with this direction, reasonable force may be used to ensure your compliance. Signature of Emergency Officer, Karen. I can actually read the signature. Name of Emergency Officer, Karen Lopez in proper case. Date and time directions made, 13 day, August 2020 at 5.45 p.m. That's the end of the letter. I want you to notice the time they're using. All these th some of these things are irrelevant at some level. They will not stop it. What you can do, though, you can start bringing up inconsistencies which cause confusion. And you're going to watch this time change between the next letter when we get to it. And I guess I should just say that. What did this say on the top of that last letter in the previous page? And we're going to go back to these back and forth. It said Public Health Act. The next letter that he gets, it uh, comes under the Emergency Management uh, Authority. Emergency Management Act of 2005. That's after what? 9-11. See, I told you they're going back to that. All this was all, all established right after they what they'd done in the, in the United States went global. And I told you the first of the year, hindsight 2020, Operation Hindsight 20, were you going to, now that you saw that, were you going to put up with the next with the next one? And you have been. Chicken little virus. Some, somebody, so everywhere they're yelling, the sky is falling, and no one's walking out to say, wait a minute. <laughs> and here's how you have to do it now. Let me go back. Let me go first to the, stay on the second page. And I want to point out that little clause. It's probably the most powerful clause in all of this letter that is the, is the option that you need. Why? You need to say, you can't just say no. Without reasonable excuse. Without reasonable excuse. This befalls you if you have no statement of excuse, they call it. Now, I look at it a little bit different. I'm going to go, the point, the, your mission, if you accept, need to accept, if you want to avoid a lot of, or put up a record that will stand against this, remember your habeas sits there as your remedy as well. You can pre, predispose that by one of these letters without reasonable excuse. If you say silent, if you just say no, that's not a reasonable excuse. And they told you right there, you have a right to have a say. You're going to find out there's a whole lot missing in this letter as well. You're also going to find out there's nothing they can do wrong, and there's no, really no immunity against anything. There's immunity against everything they do wrong. And that's the real problem for all of us across the world. This is the kind of law that the bureaucrats turn on to you because you don't even have the property of yourself. You have no rights. It's all subject to a principle that, they'll, that they have straight, the very first part of this act is the global principle. Fascinating. But here it is, without reasonable excuse. So if you think you can remain silent on anything, especially now, since 9-11 and the presumptions they put on you for being a terrorist, now you're a medical terrorist, and all this, if you think you can stay silent, you can just say no, ah, uh, boy, I don't even know what to, I don't even have a word in, my, in me to call you anything, really. I mean, I just go blank because I don't want to call you names there's really nothing bad enough to say because it's really you that's going to be in suffering this. And then you find, then you show the example of how bad you're going to be treated for someone else, and then they just capitulate. 
It's way worse than calling you a name of how bad this is. And so I, I lose I lose adjectives real quick. But let me focus the without reasonable excuse. That is the clause that says you can't just say no. I don't care where you're hearing it, how high of esteem you put people. Anybody that talks without qualification about COVID doesn't know what they're talking about. And if they talk about don't explain to you, you can't just say no. They don't know what they're talking about. And this is your life here we're talking about, not whether or not I'm right or wrong. Here's your clause. Without reasonable excuse, I can't tell you how powerful that was to see inconsistently with knowing the gentleman that got swatted up into a hotel now for quarantine, and apparently he's still there because he just said no. And he just said no in another place. So let me go through, let me see. So that's, we said there's the without reasonable excuse. I'm going to return to that. Let's go to that act. Let's start from the top. And I'm going to go to that act, and I'm going to put in, what did I see in the first letter? What do we hear? I suspect, really, right, underneath the medical examination, and then to go to the reason. The reason was, I suspect. I want to look at that word, because, you know, lawful due process requires what? For those of you that pay attention much. It, it at least requires a reason, doesn't it? And you're missing that right there. And so, oh, let me go look. This act says she can suspect. That was a question to me. That's where I start. Because I understand due process requires a whole lot more. Let's go see if that act really allows her to suspect at all. I just type in suspect in the act. The Public Health Act 2016. I'm using the text version. There's also a PDF. And the first thing that comes up is term used. Reasonably suspects. Let me keep going down here. I'm just going to click through. No, the next, a person who suspects. Well, let me read that a little bit more. This is an interesting part. Part 88, principles listed, which you're not supposed to actually limit by the principles first stated in Part 1. We're way down in Part 88 here. A person who suspects that he or she may be a, have a notifiable infectious disease must ascertain. Let me click it again. Click. The, we're just searching suspect here. Did you hear authority? That opened up. When I read that very first point, I said, well, that's not an authority for this off, so-called officer who hasn't really shown you any identification, hasn't proven on a proper letterhead, the things you start noting that makes this look like it's a bogus letter or a facsimile of an authority, a, a, a burden, a color of law imposition. Maybe I'm being retaliated against here, and they're using this color. Why it's already made, why it doesn't look authoritative on its own, and then she suspects, yet I read right here, it says a person who suspects that he or she may be, have a notifiable infectious disease. Click again. Let's look for suspect. Number five, no, in the same section, to the extent to which the exercise of these rights does not infringe on the well-being of others. A person who is at risk of contracting, who suspects that he or she may have, or who has, notifi who have a, has a notified viable infectious disease or a notifiable infectious disease-related condition has these rights. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Again, there's no third-party right here in this section for to for anybody to suspect and then they throw on the person who thinks they might have the somehow the ability to magically determine if it's a notifiable infectious disease that's another problem that's also where you can say and you have to say i had no knowledge that i could be at risk that's susceptibility, isn't it? Right here, number five gives you the four or five points I've been telling you to have in your mind to say or write down or make a record of. You had no knowledge of an, that you were the person who has the notifiable infectious disease, no, and you didn't know that you were at risk of contracting it. And the letter does not point out either. No, the letter talks in the third person who suspects Without authority to suspect. Let's leave it there and keep going. Again, as I'm, this is I'm kind of going, I'm go, I kind of, I'm going through exactly, well, a little bit refined what I did immediately when I saw these letters. I'm just looking through and I'm trying to get a, a I'm looking at the dynamic. I'm getting a idea. How does this play out? What is who does what? Where? How? Why? 
she said that the the, 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 the health officer says that she suspects I, that's, that is a, is that the proper authority I'm looking number four go down in another section without limiting subsection three the force that an authorized officer the force that an authorized officer officer or police officer may use to enforce a test order includes any force that is reasonably necessary to use the circumstances to overcome any resistance to the enforcement of the test order, including the obtaining of taking or taking of the sample that is the subject of the order. That is offered by the relevant person. That is offered by the relevant person or that the officer, authorized officer or per, police officer or officer reasonably suspects will be offered to the relevant person. What did you hear new terms? Relevant person? We didn't go through the list of terms. I never saw where relevant person is. You have to be compliant to the one with what? The officers reasonably suspect or before that that you suspected to have a notifiable infectious disease. The suspicion by an officer has to be reasonable. The letter claims just suspect. That's insufficient. That's your first point. She didn't bring any reasonable suspicion, together with the fact of the lack of letterhead, the lack of compliance with the code, the lack of uh, the failure of identifying COVID as a valid infectious agent. We're not talking. Remember, we're not to that point. I would jump down to where. What is the reason? Because that's the most important part. The rest of it falls if you can kill this. We'll get to the top of that letter. But COVID sits there as the reason that she had to not just suspect. The, it's fate that order, that notice is facially fa fatal because it doesn't say reasonably suspect and then provide how. This particulars. And there's a list for that in this code. Let me keep going uh, through this. It, there's the key right there. She didn't have the right to merely suspect. She had to have reasonable reason. She had to reasonably suspect. There's also a term called reasonably believe. We'll get to some of those. There's another for they continue talking about reasonably suspect. So it will be offered by the relevant person, not the officer, the relevant person. OK, so this came from somebody who comes to them. Continuing down, you see, again, I just want to now focus on, for the officers, the authorized or police officer, it requires a reasonable suspicion, not just mere suspicion, that also requires the reasonableness stated. The failure of which on the letter brings that into flaw, lack of notice, lack of reason, actual, even though it's under the statement of reason for. That's a fraud. That's what you state in response. But the failure to identify a reasonable cause and explain it under the heading of reason is fraudulent representation in violation of the order of the law itself. Power to obtain identifying particulars. A holder of the officer may exercise the powers in Part 3 at the act in relation to an offense or suspected offense under this act. A suspected offense requires what? A reasonable belief, at least. A reasonable suspicion. You'll see this consistently. I wanted to kind of point this through. Maybe I can stop here, but you're going to see that if an emergency officer reasonably suspects that a person, does it say just suspects? No, the government needs that limitation. I'm done. I went right back to the top. I've gone through most of those. For the word suspect, why did I key on that? It's in the letter. The letters will tell you their failure most of the time unless they're actually complete. I've never seen one administratively complete. And I'm not talking just the P's and Q's and the grammaticals. I'm talking about substantially to the law. And that's what we just went through. Let me type in now the word believe. We didn't see belief. Uh, I'm just telling you that the uh, where due process would have, well, if they have to have now reasonable suspicion, they have to have probably a reasonable belief. And, or reasonably believe. So sure enough, we put it in. Section 247 pops up. Uh, and I don't know why it didn't. Maybe that's the first time it comes up. But the applicant reason, reasonably believes that a judicial officer is not available within the reasonable dist distant, with a reasonable distance of the applicant. I'm not going to even tell you context, context here. There has to be some basis for the belief. The believe. Which is likely a lie. Be lie. Requiring information for a person believed to have notified infectious. 
person believed it. These are the titles. Now, let's get to when you get to the text. The text is where the law is. In, in any proceeding against a person uh, for an offense under Section 1 of failing to notify a chief health officer, it is a defense to, to prove that the person believed on reasonable grounds that another person had been given the chief officer, uh, chief health officer the required notification. Reasonable belief of a belief. You see how you have to support what your statement is. This is in the law. I'm reading right from the Act. Clicking again, going to the next one. I'm the word, just searching the word believe. In any proceeding against the person offense uh, under subsection failing to give the patient the information required by section 97, it is a defense to prove the person believed on reasonable grounds that another person had given the patient the required information. That's where you are seeing that you got to take away something called good faith reliance. Am I making that up? We're going to go right to that term next. I'm showing you their standards, and this is how you attack them. They didn't do any of this stuff. They couldn't have reasonable grounds when we get to COVID-19 being symptoms and not the infectious agent. They couldn't have invented this because the person who was supposed to didn't have knowledge and couldn't be susceptible. You take away, you succinctly state what it is that they don't have that they required by the act to have. I click again. We're going to go down next. Believe. I'm just searching a term in the in this act. Uh, that is, um, we'll relive the relevant counseling in relation to a notified infectious disease means counseling that is given by a person whom the chief health officer reasonably believes is suitable, qu suitably qualified, and experienced. In other words, they have to the, when they there's going to be a re relevant counseling relevant to this disease that the health officer is going to delegate someone to do that. He still has to have a reasonable belief that the person they send to you, if you've got the, the suspicion that you think you have it, can be counseled. Was this gentleman, I have not heard that this gentleman was counseled before he was swatted. That's another point. He wasn't given the opportunity to understand, given that, that there was this requirement, and they say that they have to give you this opportunity. Just saying no hands them that they... We're doing all this. Saying that they didn't and re that you required it now flips the burden on them and you tie it to fraud and then you also tie it to an ulterior motive like when we get to the vehicle code where they stopped them and released them that this could have been retaliation. Why the letter is incomplete. Why he didn't get counseling. Why he didn't get told he has right to counsel. I hope you're hearing that there's a whole lot more behind these things. If you shut up and you don't listen to what I'm saying here, with this imperative coming down on you and haven't done any things I've been telling you, this is what they get to beat you down with. Their victory is your silence, as Vince Vinny mentioned in that Twitter and what I say at the bottom of, your, of my broadcaster. Silence is the victory. You can't keep quiet on this anymore. And you, but you have to be, when you speak, you speak in the right point. You don't speak about what you think is going on, what you think has to go on. You think with, you speak within the constraints of what they're supposed to be going on. Let me keep going here. A lot to go through. Uh, 100. This is a very important section. Chief health officer may, may, may take, uh, may take test orders. That's another word. The must. Okay. They said must, not shall. This is administrative. Understand what that means to you. But let me read this. The chief chief health officer may take may take, may make a test order in respect of a person, parenthetically, the relevant person, if the chief health officer reasonably believes that. Let me keep moving. We're just looking at the word be believe and finding out if, like suspect, it has to be a reasonable suspicion, and with belief, if it has to be a reasonable belief. In other words, they just can't make a statement without supporting it, and then you get to interrogate whether or not that's a true statement. And let me move on some more. To click some more. We're going down just above one, uh, 100. Before making a test order in respect of a deceased person, the chief health, health officer must consult with senior next of kin of the de deceased unless the chief health officer reasonably believes that is not practical 
This is different than practicable, you'll find in this. I told you the burden-shifting word is practicable, not practical under the circumstances to undertake the consultation. And let me show you why it's not practicable, the word they use here in practical. The gentleman's, or the, the body's, the, the, the person is deceased. So there's a leeway there. It's not like a moving target that they have to keep up with. We keep on moving. Believe. All I'm searching is a word here. We're looking to see whether or not every con uh, context of believe has to have a reason. And then uh, the next one at 107, a deceased body reason to believe. And it's consistent. You'll find this is keep ide your ideas on how consistent this is from condition to condition within the act and whom is, uh, needs to have a reasonable suspicion and whom doesn't. And the one who they're looking at supposed to be this relevant person who's supposed to know they think they have this stuff is the only one that can say where there's no reasonable belief they need. They just need, when you look at the, how this works, someone who believes, oh, I've got COVID, oh, I'm coughing, i got to run into the hospital. You're the one that, that makes that determination. There's no way for you to reasonably believe. You just feel it. So they don't even have to put that in that section. Now, when you get to the official, they have to do things by reason. And I'm showing you that that's it's consistent. I keep going. Click again under 116. The chief health officer reasonably believes that a person. Uh, this is around the public health order. This is very important because a suspicion is not a reasonable belief, and it's not certainly not a reasonable suspicion required under the act. The reason given for the net letter is insufficient in minimum fraud, as far as its utility. Where then they then take you off the street. Again, we go move on to where we have believe and believed when it we need remove we remove from the the reasonableness when someone themselves figures out you see that consistently stated in the next thing the public health order must and the must is may or may not depending on the condition name the notifiable infectious disease the person is believed to have or to which the person is believed to have been exposed in case of requires. Uh, in case they require that section requires a reasonable belief on the official and not a reasonable any reason for someone who just suspect is suspicious they have it you see consistently how this rolls out moving on i just click again i'm just going to go through fifth five a of 125 reasonably believed to be then we move down to 128.2. The health officer reasonably believes. Again, I'm going on and on. Reasonably at 123. It keeps going on. Reasonably believe. You don't see even suspicion here now. The word reasonable is a conditioner on this. When they don't have the right reason, their notice is ineffectual. It doesn't give you the proper notice, and it doesn't come by the right standard. We three things I'd throw right together, even if I was kind of hesitant to say, oh, you don't have authority. So I think I'm going to stop... On the believe, we now see every instance, and I'm just, you're just going to have to see it yourself, every instance of the word believe, belief, or whatever, has to have reasonable in front of it. Now, in front of it. now I want to run down and put in, uh, oh, good faith. Now I want to do that, and we'll look at the good faith. Why am I doing that? Because the people who want to put sus, they can suspect they also have to do so not just as a reasonable a reasonable suspicion that you see not in that letter but you have to also have a good faith I'll say reliance that what you're saying is proper so let's look up good faith and this is just going through due process this is what I'm saying what sometimes I say stuff of why I even look at word why would I look at good faith that's what they have to have when you go do this, they have to proceed at the highest levels, if you will. And so I put in good faith. I get down to 209. We see a, a property is lost or that the case requires damages is caused to the property because the exercise by a person in good faith of a serious public health incident power or emergency power or the power under part 12, division six or section 199. And I won't. And this is relative to insurance policy. Click down and farther down. I'm at 237. And this started a little bit late, but at any rate, uh, protection for certain purposes. A person, quote, the informant, is not liable, liable in any way for any loss of da or damage suffered by any person because the informant has not given information or produced a document in good faith to an inquirer for the purpose of the inquiry. Number two of that, uh, 237. 
that action and tort does not lie against an inquirer or any person acting under the direction of an inquirer for anything the inquirer person has done or omitted to do in good faith for the purpose of the inquiry of an inquirer's report under section 238. Let me interject right here so I don't forget it. Where they don't have good faith, does the action and tort lie? Yes. So your duty is to show they couldn't act in good faith. And really, this is all I've been ever telling you about COVID, how to expose them for there's no reasonable belief, reasonable suspicion they can derive, and they cannot proceed in good faith. Because if it, they, if they are presumed to proceed in good faith and there's no notice that they aren't, they are presumed to be in good faith and they are immune and protected. Uh, 297, an action in tort does not lie against a person for anything the person does done in good faith. Moving on, uh, in spe uh, spe if specified information is disclosed or used in good faith in accordance of the, of the regulation. Uh, that good faith now turns to that v motor vehicle stop that Jim got involved in before they swatted on him what they noticed that he didn't answer to. Information is disclosed in good faith under Section 304 or by an enforcement agency or public authority in compliance with the request under Section 5, and no criminal or uh, civil or criminal liability is incurred in respect of the disclosure. What if the disclosure is not done in good faith? When is that established? It's not established after the fact, I can tell you that. And that's why I say your letters up front are so important here. That's why I've been telling you this the whole entire time this way. Uh, going down some more, if a medical practitioner, nurse practitioner, or a responsible pathologist in good faith notifies the chief health officer, uh, going on, 113, we're back up to the top, it is uh, if a responsible pathologist or pathologist, medical practitioner, nurse, midwife, qualified person, or other person in good faith reports, now, there's lots of provisions. We go on to 138. If a person is required under Section 133 to give information to an authorized officer and gives that information in good faith, I'm in good faith, I go click, click, click. You see good faith coming up. That is the, the, the definition of for or the direction that you have the duty to take it away if you w intend to protect yourself. Self, because if they don't, they are proceeding underneath the standard of good faith. How do you stop it? You can't just say no. You have to resp be responsive to the letter they sent you. On point. You don't go flying off. You focus right on what they were supposed to do and what, what they didn't and how that harms you. Ex extension of policy. I think I'm going to move on. The point is good faith is the thing they use will provide their immunity, and if you strip it from them, and sufficiently so, because there's gray areas about whether you've done that, it, when you strip that from them, then they are susceptible. And until you strip that from them, the entire system works on the presumption they're doing okay, they're lawful, and they are immune, and they are. There's no way you're going to uh, overturn this. Let me now move on to the letter, the clause in the letter, without reasonable excuse. How many times are we going to see it in here? Your, your right and need to respond. Because you just, you can't just say no. Failure to comply with the requirements of an authorized officer. This is directly out of the letter. A person must not, without reasonable excuse, fail to comply. If you say no, that's not a reasonable excuse. The direction in this act is to respond with a reasonable excuse, and we'll find the next term, lawful excuse, sort of a certificate of authority to be returned, a person who contravenes Section 1 without a reasonable excuse, the onus of proving of which is on the person who commits the offense. Notice you're committed to have done the offense. This is not something you do after the fact to stay away from the onus either. As you should be able to hear what I've been telling you, you have to move first. You have to throw this into a condition where, they're, where they cannot be presumed to be correct, and then you engage the administrative side, and until that is answered sufficiently in law, it's still an open question. It's still, you, that is your excuse not to know more, not to have to do more. Number 98 um, section, offensive falling, failing to provide patient with information. Did you know you're supposed to have information? 
Well, a medical pr pr practitioner, a nurse practitioner, who without reasonable excuse fails to comply. Reasonable excuse. Without reasonable excuse, offenses of failing to comply with the test order. Here it is for Jim. Any one of you that gets these orders, any one of you that's ordered that you're going to have to have an ankle bracelet. You're going to have to sit down and write real quick, orally do it, and then tell them you need time and an attorney for sure, whether or not you take counsel or whether or not you just use that time while you're saying you're looking to write down this kind of a letter. And notice, actually. And I would do, once you get down to there, I'd be doing some legal certified mailings, whatever your country allows. And let me preface something here. If you think you're sick and you think you need to do something, don't do what I'm saying. Go get yourself checked. But when they do like this gentleman with the with the heart problem, with the, excuse me, the chest pain, and then they throw a quarantine on you, now they're interfering with your medical rights under the color of a COVID, which you know is just a symptom. And now all of a sudden, the COVID symptoms displaced your chest pain. And they're supposed to impose upon you as minimal as possible. We haven't got to that yet. A person named in the test order... This is right, right to the letter now, section 104, without reasonable excuse fails to comply with the requirement. You have to have the excuse. Uh, number two in that order, a, a responsible person named in a test order. That's someone who has a child from an incapac one with uh, someone who's caring for somebody else uh, as well. Without reasonable excuse. So there's the clause that go on in 122. A person in relation to whom a public health order is in effect must not, without reasonable excuse, fail to comply. Just saying no is not a reasonable excuse. Those that tell you just to say no are misinforming you terribly, terribly. Okay, so I'm going to end on that. We can go click, click, click. It's the same. Then I notice something else. There's not just a reasonable excuse, but there is a lawful excuse that's distinct and different and in different places. And so I want to be, for those of you that are going through this, you'll do this in any act. You're looking for the due process that's built in, and you're looking to compare it to whether or not that was provided to you. I'm going to now look at the lawful excuse at 233. A person must not without lawful excuse refuse or fail. Reasonable and lawful. What have I been telling you to do? You throw out your lawful remedies. They're not excuses. These are where they failed and they may actually be colors of fraud or by omission, which they attempt in this act to try and diminish and cause the people to look like they're completely immune. But when you strip them by your prior discussion or even once you get involved with your immediate discussion of, of how they're uh, completely wrong and hopefully you're putting it, able to put it down in writing, then you are you are no longer giving them uh, handing them by your silence by saying no the presumption that you didn't have a lawful excuse either and then you're stating what it is clicking down this is lawful at 2233 is where you see lawful excuse not reasonable 234 is not a lawful excuse for the purpose of 233 for an individual to refuse to answer a question or produce a document on the ground that the answer or document might tend to incriminate the individual that's a big one right there. So this is what I was telling you. Your right to remain silent against yourself is stripped under a medical a medical imperative, under this type of police power. And so you can't, for that reason, it's not a lawful excuse. See, you see, you went right to your constitutional right or whatever to remain silent, like for us in the United States. That's not a lawful excuse. You see, they're talking to law. I've told you, you attack them with the law. Everything you come back with is a lawful excuse, not a reasonable excuse. You use a reasonable excuse and then uh, the lawful excuse in the nature of a reasonable excuse may be as close as I would get to that on a document or in an oral presentation back to start refuting them. You better start taking notes, too, because you're going to need to know those. Incriminating, uh, lawful excuse, you're now relying on the law. You see the distinction between reasonable and lawful excuse. We need to go more. That was really an important one right there. A person must not, without lawful excuse, refuse to fail. Again, it's there. It's those are the things that tell you, ju those that tell you just say no are hurt, going to harm you or themselves by relying on that. Let me look at something else because it wasn't mentioned. And normally when they put you in this kind of thing, if you're not capable, there's usually someone that should come in and help you. Typically it's going to be what? You're... A legal, lawful representative, a legal representative, some attorney, 
right? They call lawyers. Uh, I have. I won't worry about the quibbling. Let's put the word lawyer in here and see what might turn up. Why? Because I didn't see any notice relative to representation or protection or challenge or any of that stuff. I saw nothing, but normally you're supposed to be able to do that. Lawyer, just plug it in. I'm searching the document, the act, a statement. Uh, here, this is, let me roll that up because this is a very important. Section 101, this is after the test order. Process for making a test order. A statement that the person who is required to comply or facilitate compliance with the order has the right to obtain legal advice and to communicate with a lawyer. Did you see that in the letter? I don't get all hoppity here because they'll tell you later anything that's missing that they said that you're supposed to, that's required to, to do this. That's not an excuse to invalidate the order. If you don't know what technocracy is going to do in Bureau Rats, then this is what you're starting. You'll be able to understand in this document, this Health Act in Australia, they're imposing it right here. But they're supposed to tell you that you had the right to communicate and have legal advice. The letter is deficient as that. If you leave that blank, that this in part because they didn't offer it and the law says it is, it brings that notice that you got into a lot, uh, into at least the appearance of impropriety and ineffectual notice inadequacy of notice. It didn't give you a ability to remedy their imposition under mere suspicion and nothing else. So lawyer is involved. They're supposed to tell you. It says it right there that you also get to know under 102 that the person had the right to obtain legal community advice. It's not just a one-off. It's throughout this document. A statement that the person, going on again to another one, that the statement had the right to obtain legal advice and communication, clicking to the next occurrence. Uh, 119, it sits in there uh, to communicate with a lawyer. I didn't hear Jim at all be given this opportunity, and there wasn't a statement, but I'm not there. I don't know. You can use it. You have the right of counsel against going after them and buying time if you have to, if you're not going to get one. 120, the person is entitled to obtain. Did you see that in the letter? No. When they didn't offer it and they're just moving you into SWAT, into compliance without the direction under mere suspicion that's not compliant with the code, you have full right to make that statement that it appears to be a fraud used under color as a retaliation, as a line that you might want to try. Advisory panel. There's supposed to be lawyers on the advisory panel. Well, there are people everywhere, aren't they? Uh, the person is entitled to another click, 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 159. Again, uh, one review of the requirement to remain on the premises, remain quarantined. That's important because he's got his third letter. We haven't quite got there yet. Well, I hope I get there. On that third letter, he was to supposed to be told he had to com communicate with a, with, a with a lawyer. Going on, uh, 186. You have the right to communicate. I think that's enough. You hear. It's throughout the document. Let me run into legal advice as a term. Why am I doing this? I'm going through and I'm looking where in this act that I'd have no clue about. It's Western Australia, state of Western Australia. I don't know about that law. But do they have due process where rule of law and democracy exist? And I take the presumption that it's going to be there because it is, or at least the appearance of, of due process. And that we can rely that we're going to find it. And so I'm looking for the elements of what would constitute all of that. Now, you may not understand that yet, but you're hearing me go through some of it. And you, and so we, given that's the case, you can then start adding that to your understanding. And legal advice. I want to see, okay, this thing, is it consistent? Uh, search, search, search. Yeah, you end up going through the same style, the same things when you communicate with a lawyer. You have the right of legal advice. Was that in the letter? No. So we got two qualifiers right there. This ends up going down to chapter 186. Do I go there now? I think I might scroll down to 186 real quick. I have a note that this is a really contingent on 186. Uh, not that it's an overpowering section, just the point of review for this. And this, the enforcement, excuse me. Uh, further provisions relating to requirement to remain in an area or remain in quarantine, what I just pointed out. So I'm anticipating the 186. Not only do you are you supposed to get this legal advice notice to yourself, in other words, you have a remedy there. And they're supposed to make provision for you, notice opportunity, time and place. That's due process. 
they have to give you the notice you have the opportunity for a remedy against their order, their notice. And they didn't do any of that. That on its face is a due process violation. The failure to do so commits a due process violation against me that allowed me a remedy against a fraud. That's a violation. I'm just going now off the reason and the con the reasoning and the notice that wasn't provided. The omission. They'll claim omissions are not actionable. You take away their good faith, it is, you heard. And so legal advice is right through this thing. Uh, and it was relating back to the further provisions when they have the guy ad extending him, Jim, in the motel in quarantine now for maybe a month. I, I don't remember the time. Let me now move into... Uh, the motor vehicle statement, because he was stopped in the story. He stopped in a in a motor vehicle prior, but he's not removed then. And this this caused me to start thinking about chronology and due process. Let's just simple word search in the document. Does the Health Act provide uh, any kind of notice uh, or uh, provisions for motor vehicles? And I'm not going to get into all that motor vehicle legalism talk. We're just talking about is it here? And when you're interacting with someone, and this guy was a trucker, so that works. What was the authority of the of the government at that at that point? What what were they supposed to do? And I'm having a little bit of trouble here for finding that. Excuse me for a second. I had to, and I don't see it. Anyway, there's a provision for motor vehicle. That provision, if you read it carefully, when they stopped him and they released him, they were had finished their function. And they finished their function relative to what they did, and they come back with this later was actually a statement in, the, in your response you had to make, that this is what it looks like retaliation when they didn't identify you as someone who was somebody suspect. And without proper lawful reason stated in the letter, they now have imposed this is is a violation of the use of the of the uh, health act and a violation of the motor vehicle which at the point of contact where they released him did not find he was someone that was suspect and so uh, i'll throw that out there let me move on the word sustainability now this is completely out who would you why would you uh, even look for this well i wouldn't but i'm going to I'm going to just tell you, when I found this, it was mouth draw dropping because of its clarity and statement. And what does it have to do with, with all, with anything? When I read through the document, it talked about proportionality. That's why we started to look at it. What What is proportionality if it's not sustainability? And sure enough, in part one, they aren't even bold enough, though, to put it to you in a section you can see in the table of context of the act. But you read down in part uh, three part one uh, subpart three and you see this uh, that all of this in pursuit of the objects of this act re regard must be had to the principles set out in the table and in a table and i'm still trying to figure out the authority for this putting your information in a table that should just be a referential thing you think not authority in the table, looking under sustainability, sustainability is there for all of you naysayers or those of you that were already in the choir but wondered how far along it was. Here, it's already been put in 2016 in the Health Act of Western Australia. Sustainability principle, the sound public health practices and procedures should be adopted as a basis for sustainability for the benefit of all people and the community today while considering the consideration is given to the public health social, economic, and environmental needs of the future. Now, interjecting here, what those have to do with an em eminent emergency health thing, I don't know. But you know, when you read the section right before this, you'll see that this act, that part was given royal assent before other parts in the act were even enforced. Royal assent doesn't mean that you run the country as a people. And so those of you that are naysayers over the the Queen's hold chokehold over that country and doesn't and what I've talked about about the Queen supporting the Catholic Church and sustainability apparently there's been given royal assent I'm going to assume it's a law they've been using it and it was div given before the rest of this transformative 
act which replaces the 1911 miscellaneous parts. You'll read all about this, how this works. Number two, public health, social, economic, and environmental. Social, economic, and environmental pillars of sustainable development imposed as a consideration and principle proportionately balancing your rights means you have none. Uh, me is a factor should be considered in decision making another sustainable term with the objective of improving community well-being not yours uh, and the benefit of future generations whatever what does that have to do with an immediate health problem and be careful here this act that we're reading from for this is just the communicable part there may be others but when you're tied down to SWAT being SWAT teamed under the presumption of reasonableness and whether that's suspicion or lawfulness, whether that's an ex the excuse, you're not, you're not going to just say no to this. Number three, public health practices and procedures should be cost effective and in proportion to the significance of public health risks and consequences. What am I talking about when we go to COVID-19? That's just symptoms. That's not the infectious agent. Precautionary principle under sustainable development. Uh, sustain sustainability. If there is a public health risk, lack of scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent, control, or abate the risk. Why, I tell you, you have to hit this as a fraud up front, so they can't even say there's a bit of concentrated evil that they think looks like COVID that might be in the rare area. You have to hit this as a fraud up front. You can't let them attach any proportioning to this at all. Uh, so if, if if you that have been listening to me or you understand about sustainable development and you've been telling people about it, this is why I tell you to do certain things. You have to nip this at the bud right before it becomes a bud. You have to be so insightful to see there's going to be a bud there, and I need to clip that branch. We don't want buds quite yet. And for those of you that want buds, you know trimming is a good way to get better. Buds later. You get the buds you want bud. In an application of the precautionary principle, decision-making should be guided. See, it's only about decision-making. Who is that? It's the bureaucrats that are presumed to have authority to destroy your lives. Proportional to the community's needs, which, who, which decides what? Is decided by them. A careful evaluation to, the, to avoid where practicable the harm to public health. That, you can jump in and say, it was your burden to show you haven't done excessive, even to this one. An assessment of the uh, risk-weighted consequences of the of the of the options assessment. How did you start your assessment when uh, you're just dealing with symptoms and there is no test? Number three, principle of proportionality. This is where it comes in in the act. They're supposed to balance your rights against this. The decisions are made and actions are taken uh, in the administration of this act to prevent, control, or abate public health risks should uh, be proportionate to the public health risks sought to be prevented, controlled, or abated. Blah, 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 blah. You take away the public health risk by saying there is no test and symptoms are not the communicable part of the disease. And all of a sudden they have nothing to balance proportionality to. So I could read uh, more. There's more that I need to talk to. So I was going to have us look at proportiona. It's not the full word. You find that in the act. i got to keep moving here. Proportiona is just to say there was different forms of proportionality. So I'm looking for the rudest, the most root term so I can see where that shows up in the act. And what is it in context with? And it relates, direct, when you see this, it relates directly to where anyone might set up a defense. That the decision on that is still going to be conditioned by this proportionality consideration and sustainability. You have to defeat their ability to do that to you. And you do that by taking away, as I'm challenging right up front, it wasn't reasonable suspicion, just mere suspicion, Reasonable suspicion may be to the one that they're looking at to have believed they were infectious, but not to a third party. The, the good faith reliance isn't told to them until you say so. And that there may also be lawful excuses that they have not informed you of or that you knew were there, and you have to let them know to take away that provision. In Section 88, we also have called something called medical exam. Go through the medical exam term. I don't have time now to move through that. 
It's just going to show you that there's this medical exam. It is a term. Why do we say that? Because now we're back to that letter. It talked about a medical exam. It's the whole of the subject matter. That you shall go there for this reason. And it says here at the part, 20, uh, part 88, relative to the medical exam, number one, the spread of notifiable infectious disease. What's that? We're going to find out here shortly. The regulation, there's a regulation defining that term, notifiable infectious disease. See, a term is not a word. A term can be many words. Notifiable infectious disease. You see communicable disease right there, and then one that the health administrator said, you're going to, all these health officials and all these people, and even yourself, have duty to identify or try to whether or not it's notifiable because they have to jump on this thing really quickly if it's real but it's notifiable infectious disease is a term there's a regulation defining that we're going to get to covid in a moment here restricting a person personal liberty under this part or privacy and in the application of the of the of this principle particular regard should be had to the principle of proportionality set out in section 32 so within the context of this, this notifiable infectious disease, your rights and privacy are conditioned by the community and what the bureaucrat, bureaucrat does, the technocrat decides. And there's no real standard for that. And they get that power because you remain, you just said no instead of doing some of the things I'm saying. And there's more. I mean, you, some, some of you should be able to read through this and find even actually more. I'm not going to talk to even just a part of what's available. 89, further provisions relating to the applicable principles. The principles that are applicable are the sustainability upon your rights. This is where someone like Max Egan will tell you you really have no rights. And I've been telling you that's right unless you can remove this condition. And the way you do it is you assert the law that was not followed because these people do the alternative dispute resolution. This is the process that you're under that they presume that they're doing right unless you say so otherwise and the way you stop it is to bring a savings provision of a prior right that they couldn't interfere with that's what that practicability stand, uh, standard is and I told you about that with the BLM before they have to really come to a, they have a, the, they, the government has the high burden to say that they couldn't do anything else and then even so that could still be a constitutional challenge those provisions of which you challenge in your letter as well so you have another line sentence that says the provisions that have denied me these things or allowed the denial have been a violation of the Constitution. And you've set up that there was no actual risk that they could assess. That's when you say that one. So I have note here, chief health officer may make test orders. That, uh, number, this is uh, at number 100. Uh, section 100, the chief health officer may make test order in respect of a person, parenthetically, the relevant person, if the chief health officer reasonably believes that. We're back to that reasonable belief, not just suspicion. So you're taking a delegation of authority. The lady, Karen, writing that letter on suspicion is not even the right standard, let alone not reasonable. There has to be a reasonable belief, and they have to state what that is, the absence of which is not notice. And so you've failed due process right there. And you have to write that and tell them. 101, the process for making the test order. Test order must be in writing and must include the following. Must include, may not be shall include, because they have a provision in there that where it's not practicable, they don't have to. You have to show how it was beyond that required that they had to. You have to be there and assert the rights. The chief health, health, health officer may make a public health order. That only says at 116, you can make it when there is an infectious thing, which you, we have yet to talk yet about. I've talked about it before. We'll bring it right back up where it's COVID-19, and yet you find the regulation doesn't even recognize that. And so I'm still looking for the infectious, let alone the label. The chief health officer may make a public health order in respect of a person if the chief health officer reasonably believes. Again, on and on. There's nothing of suspicion here that Karen can have, reasonable or not. See, suspicion wasn't that standard. If it was suspicion, it's reasonable. But the health officer authority to make the order is believe reasonably believes, and it requires a statement on how the the condition. Now, let me, I think I'll stop with that. It's just going to be a repetition over and over. I want you to hear it, I guess, a little bit 
I've got a, a, a lot of here that I was going to go say, and I'm running, you know, kind of running long in time to explain the very same things over and over again. To just say no, the answers were in the act if you were going to set yourself up to protect yourself. And I don't know why anybody won't. I mean, I know it's a little bit of work, but come on, folks, it's not that hard. This section does not limit judicial review for judicial ju jurisdictional error. Go read that one. I just pa pass on through about all this stuff. 173 limitation on operation of public health state of emergency. They can't stop it, but they you have a limit. You don't have a limitation for jurisdictional error. Are you kidding me? You certainly do. And so you that's where you have to focus your attention. Th these these acts will tell you if you look carefully what you have to say. False information during an inquiry. A person must not give an answer or information to the inquirer if the person knows that the answer or information is false. What about the inquirer themselves? This is I, I highlight this. It's a ten thousand dollar fine. You return that if it's good for the goose. It's good for the gander. Yes, it's good for the one who was the inquirer who used this incompletely, inadequately, and then violated my rights and didn't provide the information to lie on the paperwork that said she had she could suspect, be suspicious. That's a lie all on its own. Again, the good faith you rip away. And uh, so let me, let me, I need to move, move, keep moving. I got so much more to point out. Oh, one other thing, and we, I guess we're getting now, I'm going to move over into the other, the other issue. What is the, going back to the top of the letter, what is the subject matter? The first sentence that we read that the, what was it? The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on 11 March 2020. If you were to respond, I just send all this stuff, but if you were to respond to this, you'd actually respond this paragraph by paragraph. And your first opening comment, and I guess I could have, should have just taped what my responses were because it actually came out really uh, orderly because of the uh, just responding to each health, uh, each paragraph. For me, I'm trying to set you up why you get to say all this. That They reference COVID-19, a pandemic. We know the very first sentence out of your mouth on this would be the World Health Organization did not. It's a fraud. A fraudulent representation. The World Health Organization declared a COVID-19 a pandemic when, in fact, what they did was characterize it only as a pandemic and did not change their assessment. Notwithstanding that COVID-19 is mere symptoms and not the infectious agent. Period. That's your sentence. That's how you open your sentence. Now, you would tie that a little bit later because that the opening sentence is an error and you're testing against something that doesn't exist. And you'll find out here when we jump there right now, the uh, regulations don't even make acknowledgement of COVID-19, which is nonetheless symptoms and not the infectious agent. This letter has no force and effect, actually. It's being used as a color of authority to retaliate against my not giving, in Jim's case, my not giving information or the whoever was the police officer mis, uh, fraudulently communicating to this officer that I was resistant or refusing somehow. And now it's retaliation. Now you twist, you, your, your answer just throws this, their offers a, op, observation about what they think they suspect on its head. Let's go at COVID-19. They say it right on the top uh, letter, of the letter. Let me run on over to, excuse me, what I want to do is go to reasonable, sus, reasonably suspects first and tell you there's a law. i got more links uh, in part 239. Reasonably suspects has the meaning given in the Criminal Investigation Act of 2016, Section 4, if you don't think they're really tying this thing up underneath the skin. And when you go there, it says reasonably suspects meaning of, for the purpose of this act, which was the Criminal Investigation Act, which they've adopted now. You don't think you're make, being a criminal. Well, there it was. Uh, the purpose of this act, a person who re reasonably suspects something at a time, at a relevant time, if he or she personally has grounds at the time for respect, suspecting the thing, and those grounds, parenthetically, even if they are subsequently found to be false or non-existent, when judged objectively or reasonably. So now you see the combination of the reasonable uh, grounds that have to be stated that are missing in the order that would have qualified at least that she was paying attention. So it's not that she just suspects, she's supposed to reasonably suspect, and there has to be grounds, as I was telling you, uh, and that's right in the criminal code they're impo imposing upon you. And and so let me, let me uh, I kind of did this out of turn, let me jump up, let me just mention, I won't jump up, the regulation, 
I'll, I'll give you the punchline here, uh, the punchline a little quick before we get to the document. Go back, in, the, in the discussion relative to looking at the act and the words and getting to the letter talking about COVID, and then you go to the regulation because it's not mentioned, COVID's not mentioned in the act except as an amendment for another act amending this, this public health act for COVID, when you go read that link, you'll find it only changes out terms and this and that and, and doesn't really change the substance of what I've read. Then you go and look, well, what's COVID? There's a regulation for that. Well, actually, there's not. There's a regulation for what that term is, but notifiable infectious disease. And there's a couple of lists, and I provided for you three different lists, and I think each one's different, but they're all from the government. It tells you that they're not giving you the information up front. The little differences here and there. They reference in this letter, top line, COVID-19. They reference World Health Organization. When you go to the regulations, COVID-19 is not listed as a as a, a notifiable infectious agent. The letter on its face refers to a subject matter not in existence underneath regulation, let alone the fact that the World Health Organization never declared a pandemic, but they characterized it as a pandemic and did not change its assessment. This is something how you discuss this in the letter. No, notwithstanding the fact that the World Health Organization, although included in the Act since 2016, is not actually an authority for local determination of infectious agents or sources. Got that? So you got for those of you that about sustainability, you'll look very closely in this Act. The World Health Organization is in, a part of the health of Australia and the guidance for this code. And yet they're a foreign body that actually has no direct connection to anything that's happening on the ground, the thing they're supposed to identify, the point of importance and concern in the public health sphere. It doesn't happen from the World Health Organization. So the first line that they start is ir it's irrelevant to the local authority finding the infectious agent, COVID-19 being mere symptoms, and the regulations don't even mention covid even though there's an act to amend the political, the, the health act to do so. They don't say COVID in the notifiable diseases. And they can't because it's a symptom. Guess what? Let's go down to SARS. I'll give you another link for this too. Kind of gotten off tabs here a little bit. SARS, S-A-R-S, is listed. But remember, it is symptoms as well. It isn't an infectious agent on its own. They don't even mention that in the notice, and I wouldn't even mention it. I would just point out that the regulations don't speak to COVID. That's a ghost. And the letter is facially flawed to speak about the subject matter of COVID-19 when it's only symptoms. And then you bring up, because you have the excuse, you have the duty to tell them, I've never had known any symptoms, even if it was a thing. And so let me get back on the tabs a bit reasonable suspicion the letter had to be not just have a suspicion but a reasonable suspicion that requires underneath the criminal act that the person who believes they are suspicious that they have grounds what i was telling you early on all right so this is all perfected in the code you can copy and paste this stuff out if you have to otherwise i'd i'd truncate a letter really close i'd say the first what i said about the first line the second sentence and the second paragraph identifies an officer without identifying the actual authority officer relevant to something that doesn't exist in the as a, an emergency that uh, doesn't provide for my ability to challenge this I'm on a mere suspicion without reason the medical examination of which has no support in law for its direction now let me get to the point of serology testing the serology testing can't be used. Why? Because that's the antibody test that shows you've had it. That's the so-called blood test that doesn't exist for testing the infectious agent. It's just another PCR test. And that's the other thing you bring up. Uh, the, they say You say the serology test it cannot be used for testing. The, the swab test, which they say has not been identified, and they don't give you the grounds for the type of test because they haven't shown you what the infectious agent will be or that that test is capable of finding the infectious agent where you know there is no test. Makes this order facially uh, defective, if not felonious. 
And so we go through the discussion in a short form, what I've been telling you for months and months, how to answer the front, this, first, this first letter. And I'm going through the statutes to show you that you have grounds and support to do so, and you must do so. You don't must because you don't have to do anything. That's what must means. You don't have to if you don't want to, but there might be consequences. You do it wrong. I'm exampling to you how to show that they've done it wrong. Let's move on to the next image, Emergency Management Act 2005. When it came down to being quarantined now, they now move from a public health act to an emergency act. There's provisions for that, but that's what you challenge as being unconstitutional, in particular where they gave you no remedy to, to, to argue that it was unconstitutional or violated your rights or anything like that. Or, first of all, in this letter you treat separately, the very same answers come out. One letter that you respond with, where you're not just saying no, but actually saying something pertinent and relevant and material to what is your lawful remedies and excuses against their fraud and felony. This letter starts out the same. Further directions, I assume, uh, there's a name behind this out. They give a, that further directions subject to section 67, 70, and 72A of the Emergency Management Act. There's another position there that they've deemed it an emergency without even having an infectious agent declared and no test to do so. They open up with the same statement. It's almost the same letter at the top of it. The World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 a pandemic on 11 March 2020. It's irrelevant. What did the local state find for the infectious agent, not the symptoms? The PCR test of which is not the test for an infectious agent. In fact, there is no test known in the world. What is your Emergency Management Act order based on? On March 5th, uh, 15th, March 2020, the Minister of Emergency Services declared a state of emergency on, COVID, on the pandemic caused by COVID. Was it? Same answer. No, it wasn't a pandemic. The, it was only characterized as one, and the assessment didn't change. And there's no pandemic relative to where? Western Australia. They're determining things that are outside the, the jurisdiction things that have no test for on and on it goes through the same thing they now move into the sections of the emergency management act which you have to then adjust you have to then um, correlate over and support from the public health act failures into this one so you knock the knees out of this one and they talk about self-quarantine direction on august 20 uh, august 12 2020 you the name were given a self-quarantine direction by the authorization authorized officer See, you didn't have, you didn't, he didn't respond to say she's not questioned the authorization or the, the authority that she could be an authorized officer. He didn't respond. They get to move now. The, com the commander gets to move because you didn't respond. He now moves this into emergency management. Had you answered the first letter, you'd have made the record refuting the presumptions, refuting the good faith, ref giving them the excuse in law, and then now negating their ability to rely on the first letter to give them the power to come and keep you in quarantine. And all this time, you were supposed to have uh, representatives to help you, legal representatives. That could be your friends doing habeas, but notwithstanding that. And then he goes, I, Scott, Scott uh, Matthew Warner, acting commander. Acting, you know, on a play? Well, no, he gets to act like this because you've allowed it. You didn't answer the first one. Authorizing authorized officer. There. That's an assertion of power and right. When you respond to this one, hopefully because you responded to the first letter, you tell them he's not the authorized officer. That's a, uh, that's a fraudulent assertion. To create a color of authority to deprive you of your rights based on a fraud that COVID could be an infectious agent. And on top that there is no test. The PCR test of which is not the test for the infectious agent, the transmissible agent. The preamble here, the reading on down farther, the purpose of this direction is to limit the spread of COVID-19. How uh, is this supposed to limit? This is another provision in the act that you'd attack the first letter. You, If you attacked in the first, you just bring that forward on this one. You likely wouldn't have been seeing this letter had you answered correctly in the first one. You'd be in an administrative uh, tug-of-war until you said it, until you figured out exactly what you needed to do, at least a tug-of-war. If not, you destroy their whole position relative to someone who ends up 
proving out that they're not really sick anyway, but that's over time. The purpose of this direction is to limit the spread. How is it supposed to limit flu-like symptoms? When there is no test and there isn't a transmissible agent and there's no test that they can give you for the transmissible agent to have the purpose understood by a commander under an emergency management. A lot of words there. You could say it, you could write it down, bring the logic to the fact they are talking about flu-like symptoms, it's seasonal flu and common cold. How is there any authority in a direction for the seasonal flu and common cold symptoms not listed as something, an actual infectious agent? But see, he wouldn't have got this letter. He wouldn't be in quarantine had he sent the first one. If he did, he'd have grounds to get them for collusion now because these reports are going through to falsely give information from one authority to the next. So he declares they're an authorization uh, officer. You tell them they're not. This is how you would respond to this one as well. There's there's more. They now raise up. They say that now he's in quarantine. He's going to be in the Merc. Uh, Mercure Hotel and all that's where he's already been. He should have at least had friends filing habeas, is at least, uh, or actually writing down all this uh, determin uh, this uh, this information I've been telling you to kind of start countering this. Once you're caught up, you're kind of you're kind of stuck. But they're supposed to give you communication for your remedies, at least they say in the act. And they give a whole bunch more listing. This only happens. The second letter only happens because uh, he just said no. He didn't respond within the law to provide even the reasonable excuse, if not the lawful excuse, if not asserting fraud, uh, remedies in fraud and felony under color. And then they write down, and this is important to see the important additional information. They talk about all the fines. I don't know if you're going to notice this, and I was going to talk about it before. The premises they research is really people that are in business, the person that's in business, and you'll look at the description of what they can do. They're not talking about houses, so they're misapplying this whole thing as well. And the fines at $50,000 are typically business fines. So you're being treated, as I told you before, like you're an employer or an employee, and you're just being presumptively, willfully criminal. And you're going to pay those administrative fines. But he goes on further directions, notice, personally served. You have to refute that. You can't be personally served on something that's not within their authority. You have to just say that. It's all based on the fraud. They can't. The fraud vitiates all their acts. You just state that. Do you refute in a response letter if they do still collect you up, and then they give you this letter, and they ignore the first letter that you've answered correctly, created administrative record. You attack this letter for that. That they hadn't uh, the authority to give the letter first of all, and they didn't have the authority to personally serve a person that doesn't exist underneath their authority for the want of an infectious agent for which they're trying to stop the spread of. I'm being quiet there, so you can go back, go back on the tape and copy all that down. And then he gets another letter, dear guest. Government of West, Western Australia. Now it goes from the commander. It went from the authorized officer to the commander. Now back. Completion of the quarantine process. Because he hasn't answered, they have license to just do what, the, what they will. He's now going to be imposed. That he's going to be there in quarantine until he takes the test. And this letter would be defeated the same way. You take a test. You haven't told me what simp what infectious agent you're going to take a test for. You can't take a test for symptoms which appear to be flu-like and the seasonable cold and seasonable and common cold. And I just repeat myself. So this letter is just a continuation. You keep getting these letters because no one stops the first one. It domino effects on you, and they gain more presumptive power to the point where now they can keep you indefinitely. What I've been trying to tell you is the thing you need to avoid first and foremost. You can't just say no. Now, I, I have some linking here over to highlighting, uh, moving on to the next tab where I'm going back to the act, highlighting that relevant person that wasn't defined, but it's defined, if you will, by the chief officer's focus for the test order on the one that he's required to what have. He has to have a reasonably believe grounds that that can be done. And so when you look at part 100, and he may make test orders, it says he may not make them if he can't do these things. When you read the context of that 
in that way, that's what you speak to in your letter. And I'm not saying you have to go on and on. You could you just reduce this down to a sentence that challenges that he could not have the reasonable belief based on the, if you set it up about the fact of COVID being symptoms and there's no test for infectious agent, there could they could come to no reasonable belief. And this entire thing is coming under the color of a of the existence of an infectious agent there is no test for, invalidating every provision of it. You're taking away their good faith reliance. They may not agree with you, but that's not about that. It's about that you assert that you have a lawful presentation about why their authority doesn't vest in you. Moving over now to the next tab, this is where we get to the regulations. They talk about reason to believe. They talk about now the letters were of COVID. The Emergency Act is COVID. The quarantine is on COVID. They mention over and over and over, yet you get to the regulations in that document, part two, and their table, you look around, you don't see COVID mentioned. And why would that be? Because in some regard, though, they've, com- they've combined infectious and disease. It's not an infectious agent, COVID. It can't even be in the list. You will see SARS. That's another fraud in the table. You can say all this. You can challenge them on all of that. And if you don't, it, these tables stay just like this. When you look through the list, you'll see some real dangerous beasties out there. COVID's not a beastie. SARS isn't a beastie. Attaching, oh, it's a coronavirus onto SARS doesn't make it any more a beastie that's going to hurt you, let alone be in the list. And so if you don't have that word uh, in your mouth orally and then turn around to write it, you you should always turn around and write these things down. And you don't respond with your reasonable excuse or your lawful excuse. They are empowered to do everything they're doing to Jim. And I'm moving in now to some tabs, a lot of tabs that just go section by section 34, just to highlight some things. A person must take all reasonable practical steps to prevent and minimize any harm to the public health that might foreseeably result from anything done or omitted to be done by the person. This has to do, and I won't go on too deeper, has to do uh, health duty. If you think, you suspect that you are, Jim's answer at the point of the vehicle stop was that he didn't have it. They didn't have any. He didn't have anything he could see. He was maintaining that in the absence of a notice of the fact, he was completely preventing and minimizing. In fact, he wasn't even part of it. Yet they fraudulently claimed that he did, and they passed information to an authorized, purported authorized officer over how they're how they're authorized on something that doesn't exist. I don't know. But under the color of that uh, that transmission of fraudulent information from the officer to the authorized op- health officer, they then uh, said that he violated his duty here. Everyone has that duty. Just go ahead and accept that it is there. What your statement is, there was no notice to me that I could be an affected person. You don't have a susceptibility test. Is that what your test is going to be? No. Is your test going to be about the infection ag- infectious agent? No. It's going to be about symptoms that the test doesn't test for. It's indeterminate that the response in the PCR. Uh, okay, so moving on to this due defense of due diligence. This is uh, kind of interesting, a little bit technical, but I'll just touch it. In a pre- any proceeding against a person for an offense under this part, it is a defense to, to prove that the person took all reasonable precautions and exercised all due diligence uh, to prevent the commission of the offense. If you don't answer, if you just say no, you come you don't have this defense. You're, the fact that you answer becomes a defense of due diligence. Actually, prior due diligence that you're now making a record of to test whether or not they have done their due diligence uh, and have a standing to sue you. Okay, so you get technical. You're using now what's in there to now jujitsu these people to cough up the reality. Why? Because sustainability is no reality. Uh, as I said, I'm moving on to the next thing in part two of the Public Health Act, just to point out part one uh, of uh, other than sections three and five on the day of which this act receives a royal assent. Part one, which is this, the proportionality table, which imposes itself on your rights and your life uh, and uh, in, a, in the most important aspect of prerogative of uh, health, uh, police power health, is imposed by royal assent first before other parts of this act is you need to really see that for those of you that understand uh, that that's out there and just talk about it 
this is actually now being imposed. It, it makes a different, slightly different reflection on what you do, but if you go the way I'm saying, and you destroy their authority before they can uh, impose the public act, you're not going to have to be addressing the public act. If you, if you follow that, it's what, I, what I've been trying to get you to do, you've, like I did the minor, 3809 regulation section doesn't apply to a, a mineral entryman under uncommon mineral locatable valuable mineral deposit it does not affect them they're not supposed to apply it it's a fraud to apply it to someone it doesn't apply to you have to state underneath this in this public health law how it's a fraud to not uh, to apply it to you and you do it in in how i've been explaining even though i took some time to prep up once you understand the words you get past the words you see all the due process was there that they didn't give you. You see all the stuff they negated to tell you and explain that they were required to explain. You attack all that. The words become irrelevant. You're, just, I'm, you're utilizing the fact that they were in the act. They were supposed to regard it, whether they wanted to use it as an immunity or you can strip them of that because you stripped them by your notice. That's what that's. That's the the rules of the of that game. To to sit in the peanut gallery and just say no, I don't want to. I'm in the gallery, but I'm not want to. I don't want to talk. He's not going to get it. Powers of authorized officers for the purpose of this act, an authorized officer may at any reasonable time do any of the following. This is the section of uh, 240. This is the section where you say at which a licensable activity is carried on with. Well, if you look through licensable activities, this is really the health power of the government that's already to license these. The persons underneath these this scrutiny that doesn't need the due process because you applied for the license and or permit is subject means it's not speaking to people i wouldn't hang my hat on that i would point out that that's the context that act speaks to and you had no reasonable notice that it didn't so they can't impose what those crime those fines on you that you even had notice that you could be imposed in this way and so you, you use the act to show the parameters they were supposed to operate under and how they've expanded outside of those parameters or failed the omission to do what they were supposed to do to maintain the parameters. Uh, t uh, Section 242, incriminating answers. This is an important thing to understand. Don't think that you cannot incriminate yourself. What you have to do is come up with the answers that don't provide an answer, don't, don't, rely on the incrimination but rely on the fact that there's nothing that you had to speak to again no notice of a thing and no no evidence of it on you and then looking out at the what's known in the world to see that what's being perpetrated on people are symptoms and not an infectious agent that the that the officials are using fraudulently you're not even speaking about incriminating. You're not even getting to the information they're asking. You're 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 asserting a challenge against the fact that they're asking a question at all. So you you can't use incrimination, but you don't have to if you do it right. You won't even be there. Stopping vehicles is another thing I do want to talk about. Stopping vehicles for the purpose of stopping vehicles. Two section two forty one for the purpose of stopping vehicles underneath the section two forty. An authorized officer may use any means that are reasonably necessary in the circumstances to do so, including means that hinder or obstruct the passage of other vehicles. Number two, subsection no one does not authorize the use of means that are intended or likely to cause death or serious bodily harm to any person, whether or not in the vehicle. Number three, an authorized officer who stops a vehicle in order to exercise a power is in respect of the vehicle may uh, A, B, may a may detain the vehicle for a reasonable period of time in order uh, a reasonable period in order to exercise the power and b may move the vehicle to place suitable to exercise the power relevant to jim the truck driver they stopped they had apparently the power presumed by the uh, presumptive author, authorized officer uh, just saying no doesn't challenge the authorization does it so he's continued to be authorized at that point and he can do a couple things, detain for a reasonable period or cause the vehicle to move. Well, they released the gym to move on and carry on. I would say because of that, for but it was my letter to respond to, when they released, detained me for a short time under the act, but then released me without further notice, they provided no reasonable basis to, to even write the next letter of suspicion. You forced them to have to answer to that. 
But hopefully you've said when you get to the PCR, the COVID, the infectious agent, when you put that statement in that there's no test and the PCR only does antibody, which is not the test for the infectious agent, their reliance on even the symptoms is invalid. When you make that statement, you've eliminated this authorized officer's first attempt. And you backtrack this whole thing that you start attacking the presumptions they relied upon in fraud. You have to, that's your grounds. And so I would find, I would be attacking all the way back to the first and say, when they let Jim go, I would be responding if I was Jim, when they let me go, they provided me notice of no other further duty and no reasonable suspicion. That they come later on mere suspicion, not reasonable, and then they swat me, that's a crime. That's a crime, and you're outside, you didn't even say, the, the, the Karen didn't even say she had a reasonable suspicion required under the law. She merely is retaliating in collusion with that officer who apparently got bent out of shape over my failure uh, to agree to take a test, and he had no reasonable belief that I sh needed to take the test. Now, I do have another link that goes back and focuses on the objectives and principles. I've already went through that a little bit more. That's the sustainability, the principles that are attached. And this is where you get the word reasonably practicable. The practicable puts the burden on the government to have done everything, ever show how it did everything other than interfere with you in a wrong way, which you have had, you'd had to assert. That practicability talks about healthy environment. Now, I don't know about what this environment has to do with looking at the infectious agent and stopping its spread, because once you stop it, the environment never was relevant. It was about the spread, right? You stopped it, it's over. Environment's healthy, fine, done. No, what they're doing is they continue this connection that they're going to impose the technocracy on you and do all this stuff like monitor you where, there's, where no one challenges why that was the... Why they had to resort to that, why nothing else, like doing nothing when they stopped the spread, was better. See, this is the point. If they're doing things that's not stopping the spread, they're outside of the mitigation measure reasonability. Again, you have to have a different word in your mouth. I won't say more there. There's more to read. Uh, they, Again, the sustainability principle ties the community and what the government wants, and they destroy your private rights. Once you know that, you can attack that. And you can show how they're, re and you bring another reason why they didn't make a good record, why the first letter wasn't complete, was to actually be able to steal your rights underneath this principle. In other words, with the proper record, they couldn't, because you wouldn't have been a relevant person that they fabricated. Moving over into just a referencing, I got lots of reference stuff for anybody that's interested, the Public Health Act of Section uh, 216, Section 4, there's a bunch of definitions. I would say that for anybody wanting to get a grasp of this in Western Australia and you're under it now, you're the test case, and you need to look at all those terms. It's important to understand what you're dealing with anyway. Again, lots of uh, lots of links here that are just going to be support material for you. I wanted to point out again, I said it once, but I'll say it again. This new 2016 Act repeals much of the outdated Health Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 19. 1911, which they provide a link, uh, external link for, and, des and designated to better protect and promote the health of all Western Australians. Okay, that's a big high claim, but when they did this and they uh, better protect and it's outdated, you're looking at a modernized act. By definition, you're going to find elements of sustainability. In this case, you find it. You do, they're not even bashful to hide it. It's right there, part uh, part one, right up on top, gained royal assent, apparently. Uh, f just fascinating. It just the, the audacity of sticking that in front of everybody's face, it, just, it really got me. So more links. Let me get through some of these for you. Uh, just going through, we've got the regulation link from Western Australian Legislation website. We have the, also they refer you, find, type in COVID on that uh, public act, and it comes up in a little bitty footnote, and it says that the Public Health Act Amendment uh, to uh, called COVID-19 Response Act of 2020. You have to go read that, but I'm just, I've provided the link. Really, it's just some amendments to the, to the Health Act, none of which appear to be really going, in any regard, going to change what I told you today at all. 
that what they do is they refine it. It's the parasitic amoeba finding they have problems and readjust as someone starts to relook at it, how they're going to keep control of this. That was coming by, that link came by a, uh, where you have to look. They tell you to go look original acts as past. You look at I finally found that for you. It takes a bit of time, folks, to do all this. I hope you appreciate it, and I hope you can use this information because it's a, if you're not, I mean, maybe you should tell me so I can just stop broadcasting. But uh, this is critical in the world today. Critical to understand, it can be brought out across the world for those countries that have the uh, we have availability to it. If you just step up and just do even the most basic letter, like I asked you last week, original acts pass that COVID Act is in there. It's really just an amendment act of the first one, Health Legislation Administration Act of 1984. I have you a link there. Then I have three more links. I think of Notable Infectious Disease Table. In each one of these acts, they show something different, none of which show COVID. That's all I would say. None of these show COVID. I wouldn't wor Don't worry about the SARS-CoV-2 at that point. You're talking strictly to the letters you're getting. And all they reference is COVID-19. It's not in the regulation and can't be, you say. You just don't say it's not there. You say it can't be. COVID is a bunch of flu. It just flu-like symptoms. It's not the infectious agent. So it cannot be in the infectious table infectious disease table. Why do you say that? You truncate, you jump ahead of where they're going to just say, oh, well, we'll put that in the list. When they do put it in the list, you go back and say, no, you were of, you're not in good faith to do that. I told you these were just symptoms, and you've agreed. Symptoms can't be the infectious disease. If you understand the technique I've been trying to tell you to do. Severe acute respiratory, respiratory syndrome is SARS. They have a listing, but remember, SARS is more a, is the syndrome. It's more symptoms. There's no test for that cause either because it's, this is all like that fabricated stuff. It's novel, folks. It's, they made it up. It's an invention. And yet we find out it really is something they've invented it, but no one's, it's interesting no one's talking about it. For Australia, we won't even go there. I don't want you to go there. Coronavirus, why everyone was wrong. We'll be running through all that law, all that stuff, folks. How Jim could have done it better. How you, I hope, will do it much better. How everybody who's not imposed with a quarantine order yet, or even a direction to do anything, face masks, folks, coverings, can write your letter just like, pretend they wrote you a letter and respond in one line. Your, your authority that you're threatening everybody with is supposed to find and, and show evidence of the infectious agent. CDC, FDA for the United States says there is no test for the infectious agent. The test, the PCR test is for antibodies only, which does not determine the, the infectious agent. What supports your decision for your orders? would be the most basic of things. But coronavirus, why everyone was wrong, someone who comes to terms with getting lost in the fear aside, a fear to side of what's going on, and you don't understand about your own immune response to all this thing. It starts to bring more of a settled view that people can change. You all can start understanding not just that it's a fraud, not just that there's no test, but your body's not so defenseless here. Your spread, the spread is not what people think. Another C COVID reinfection, this time second infection was more severe. No, nonsense. When you go, they use the PCR test. I have some links for that. I even have a, a Twitter that I put out. And uh, it's a case of reinfection. Sheared, ligated, amplified, enriched, pooled, trimmed, mapped, two, aligned, realigned, constructed, visualized, and predicted using UAE BRC PCR as statistical interpretation. Not likely. It, there is no test, folks, for this. It's just you look at the constructed through the statistical inter interpretation as models. There's nothing reality. PCR result is still an antibody indeterminate. As I pulled you through all this information, you can just repeat some of the stuff here in a sentence to someone in response ahead of the time they require you to do anything. Jim, for sure now, he still now can build it. I think a habeas would be great. But for those of you in Australia, you better get ahead of this curve. That You are the test case, and you're going to cause your own failure by remaining silent on it. Grimmer, thank you for what you do at reallyremedia.com, Jules at ucy.tv, Sound Minds, uh, Normalization of Ignorance, everybody at Minds, BitChute, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, your thumbs up and all that. And I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing.
Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass.